Welcome to today's workshop on three must have projects for your data science portfolio. One of the most common questions that we get asked is which project should I work on? And typically this is from the perspective of building a one. It is from the perspective of learning, learning the right skills. And second, it is also from the perspective of building a good portfolio because before you apply for an internship or a job in data science, you will have to first create a strong resume and a strong portfolio and by portfolio, some, a list of projects, which you have put up somewhere, either somewhere publicly, either on your GitHub profile or on your Jovian profile or anywhere else, maybe on a blog or some, or on your, or your own personal website. So today I just wanted to cover three must have projects that you should do before you try and apply for data science role. Specifically, if you are looking to get into machine learning, I will also touch briefly upon what you should do. If you're looking for more of a data analyst kind of role in that case, maybe you do not need to do all three of these. Maybe uh, the first two might be sufficient. And then the third one, you might want to substitute with something else. Now, if you have to pick three projects to showcase on your portfolio, to showcase on your resume, then these are the three that I would recommend. The first one would be exploratory data analysis and visualization. And we'll talk about it in more detail. And then the second one will be, uh, should be a classical machine learning problem. So on tabular data. So this is by classical machine learning, we mean algorithms, which came before deep learning. So this is pre 2012, uh, or these are also sometimes called shallow machine learning techniques. And sometimes the distinction is also made between structured and unstructured data and structured data typically refers to tabular data, whereas unstructured data typically refers to things like images, text, audio, video, and such things where deep learning is more applicable and more widely used. And then the third one should be a deep learning project because today deep learning is so prevalent that pretty much any machine learning work you do at some point, you will want to at least try deep learning a neural networks work, not uh, work well, not just on unstructured data, like images and text, but also work really well on tabular data. So these are three projects that you should do. And this should be in some sense, your goal, uh, when you're getting started that, uh, that you do these projects in, let's say you have a six month timeline for learning. So try to make sure that at the end of six months, you have one project or maybe more than one project in each of these categories, uh, in your portfolio. So that, uh, when you start preparing your resume, when you start applying for jobs, then, um, you have these to showcase just to get, just to have a better chance at getting shortlisted and also having something to talk about during interviews. And of course, to just cultivate the skills that you need, uh, to apply uh, that you will need to, to fulfill your job responsibilities properly. Okay. So the first project that uh, we are going to look at is exploratory data analysis and visualization. So this one is something that is probably the first thing that you learn. If you've taken our course on zero to pandas data analysis with Python, that you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the basic idea here is you show, you need to first go ahead and find a real world data set of your choice online. And I will show you how to find data sets as well. So you find a data set that you find interesting. Maybe it is a topic of your interest. Just make sure that it is a large enough data set. Make sure that it has enough variety. Make sure that it has enough information in it so that you can do more than just one or two graphs or one or two questions and answers. Then it is also ideal that if you find a data set, which has some similarity to what you might see in the real world, where maybe there is some missing data, maybe there is some incorrect data, maybe there is some, maybe there is some data, maybe there are some miss, some things that you need to clean up. For example, there, there is a column called date and that date is actually written as text and you need to convert it into a proper date and maybe break out things like month, year, month, year, day of the month and things like that. So the more you can showcase your skills of parsing data set. So maybe how to read a CSV file, how to clean the data set, how to look for missing values, how to look for incorrect values, how to fill in missing values. The more you can showcase those skills, the better your project gets because then you're, uh, then one, you're learning these skills. And second, you're also showcasing to a potential employer that you know how to clean data, how to work with messy data, and then also use 
tools like matplotlib and seaborn to create visualizations and again if you've done the zero to pandas course we've had a whole lecture dedicated to the different types of visualizations that you can do so you definitely want to showcase that you can that you have different kind of graph you understand the different kind of graphs that can be created you understand when they are used you understand when they should not be used uh, so picking the appropriate visualization for the appropriate use case is very important and then you should also you also need to be able to showcase your skills in asking and answering interesting questions about the data this is one of the key things that the purpose of data analysis is to figure get insights from data and to get insights you need to first be able to ask good questions okay and uh, finally presentation is a very important part of data analysis so you should if possible at least add some documentation in your jupyter notebook or in your github repository or in your blog post and showcase it in a way that is pleasant for uh, somebody reading so it somebody should feel interested just by looking at the title they should feel interested by reading the first few lines by looking at the first few graphs so try to make it engaging so this is the first project and now we look at some examples and by the and once again if you have any questions at any point please feel free and as i'm doing this feel free to also follow along and maybe open up these links so i have posted this uh, link to this dropbox paper document in the slack channel but i will also post it here in the chat so as i am going through them feel free to look through it yourself too so what we'll do is we'll probably look at a few example projects first and then we'll talk about how can you acquire the skills that you need to do these projects and finally we'll also look at some ways where you can find interesting data sets again this is something that a lot of people have asked how do i find a good data set to work on so here are some examples and i have picked three examples here one is called whatsapp data exploratory data analysis so let me open this up this was a course project done by michael chia yin he was uh, one of the participants in the zero to pandas course so the idea here is that the data set michael is using is his own whatsapp data so on whatsapp you have this option to ex export your data and you can see he has uh, mentioned he has mentioned where you can get this information so you go into settings and you have an option of exporting chats and you can either export a chat from a specific group maybe a group that you have been part part of for several years and you have tens of thousands of messages or you can export your entire whatsapp data as well maybe go through five or 10 different threads and then start the first thing is to read the data set so the first thing is to import the data set and you can see here there is a text file chat.txt and the text file can be imported like this using pandas so this is the a pandas file and you're reading the data set and you're showcasing that it is a, a you are able to show that it is a data frame the next step is to just present your understanding of the data so for example here michael has described that there are three columns in the data set it contains date text and a nan value it turns out that there are 21000 or 23000 uh, rows of data so there are 23000 chats here and then there are also some unknown values so there are some maybe in some cases there are some nans here and there so those may need to be cleaned up so the next step after that is to yeah so the next step after that is to clean the data so there are cases where there is just an image and in which case we want to analyze textual data we don't want to analyze image data so michael has done some cleaning up here where he has written some code where he is going to drop all the tech all the chats where it refers to actually an image message being sent and it has this message media omitted so we will we'll not get into the details here but this is the idea that you look into the data set and then you understand okay there is some cleaning that is required maybe you need to remove some rows maybe you need to uh, fill in some missing values and you need to not only do that activity but you also need to document it and if you go through this post and i hope you are following along on your own if you go through this post you will uh, see how michael has explained it really well which are the rows that he is going to uh, in exclude and why he has chosen to do that okay so giving a rationale for your data cleaning for your data missing data imputation all of these things are 
pretty important. And only then you get started with exploratory analysis. So explore, there are many different ways of doing exploratory data analysis. Some people just like to take each column and create graphs for each column, uh, or some people like to start with questions. And this is something that is totally up to you because whichever way you start, you will end up doing pretty much all the analysis one way or the other. Uh, so in this case, for example, Michael has started by asking questions. So he started by asking a question, which users have the most chat messages in a group? And this is also a useful skill given a data set. Now I'm giving you a data set about WhatsApp chat, a WhatsApp chat history of a particular group. And maybe the first thing you should try to do is start to think about the questions that you would ask. Okay. And you can start with obvious questions. Obvious questions are how many total messages are there in the data set. That's one, that's something that is already clear from looking at the data frame, asking a question, which users have the most chat mess chats or messages in the group. So that's again, clear. You could also ask, okay, what is the number of chat messages per, per user? You can ask, okay, who is the, who was the earliest member in the group? Who was the last, last member in the group? So in what order did the members of the group join? Again, this is something that you can analyze based on the first message sent by each user. So there are a lot of interesting questions you can ask. And uh, the idea is you ask a question and then you figure out how you are going to do that using pandas. So for instance, for which users have the most chat messages in a group, Michael has said that we can use pandas to first group the data. So he's using a group by here. And uh, we, we can use pandas to first group the data and then he's going to count, uh, he's going to group by user and then he's going to count the number of messages and uh, then he's going to sort it in ascending order. So here you can see this is the order. There are three people in this group and it turns out that Rohit has sent over 10,000 images. And you can also visualize this. So this is in tabular format, but the same thing can be visualized here. So here, Michael has chosen to show this using a line graph. Possibly I would say that maybe a bar chart would also be a good choice here. So you may want to just showcase a bar chart because showing three bars side by side might be more informative here. Okay. And uh, so on, right? So now you have question two, which emojis are the most used? And you can see here that these are the most used emojis, the laughing emoji, the laughing and head turned emoji the strong arm emoji and here a pie chart makes a good, uh, is, is a good choice. Then you have uh, distribution of emojis per user. How does that differ? Most active hours on WhatsApp. So here we are looking at how much time are people spending and at what is the time, uh, which time of day is, are people the most active in terms of sending messages? You can see here that it turns out that most of the messages are sent around uh, 1 PM to 5 PM. Seems like that is the range and so on. Okay. Then you have question four and question five. And then at the end, maybe there are some inferences as, as well. So here a word cloud is a, again, a very interesting thing to showcase. So this is an exploratory data analysis project and that's it. So it's not very difficult. You need to know the skills you need to have for this are basic Python programming. You need to understand NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Seaborn. And once you know these, it's simply a matter of picking a data set and you really don't have to spend too much time picking a data set as well. Start with the first thing that you can find online. And I'll talk about how to find data sets and just start exploring. So there's no right way to do it. Uh, you just start exploring, start doing, start, start messing around with the data, start drawing graphs. And when you feel confident, maybe you want to then go back and say, okay, do I need a bigger data set? Do I need, I want to showcase all the skills. I want to showcase cleaning. I want to showcase analysis. I want to showcase maybe merging multiple data sets. I want to showcase visualizations. You want to showcase your presentation skills. And then, so then you, maybe you might want to consider the data set that you've just analyzed. Does it satisfy all these criteria? If not, then maybe go back and find another data set. Maybe go back and find a large enough data set. Maybe go back and find a complex enough data set. Maybe go back and find a dirty enough data set and build your project. And once you build your project here, for example, 
Michael has written a blog post and a blog post is a great way to showcase your project. So you can create a blog post or you can just put all of this information into a Jupyter notebook and put it up on GitHub or on Jovian. So you can see here, this is the Jupyter notebook that Michael was using. So now Jupyter notebook is good for a technical audience. But it's often a blog post is often better when you are presenting it to let's say potential employers, because in a Jupyter notebook, there is a lot of uh, unnecessary code, which is mostly like functions that you're going to use imports and things like that. What you can do is uh, when you're writing a blog post, you can remove a lot of those things and you can talk more about the insights and you can talk more about the data set and you can talk more about the uh, inferences that you are drawing. And which is really the whole purpose of data analysis. The purpose of data analysis is not to write code. The purpose of data analysis is to gather insights. And that's where putting your work, putting your code in the Jupyter notebook and then putting the results and maybe just the outputs in a blog post is a good idea. It's like a report for your project. Okay. So that's one example project, WhatsApp data analysis. And this is done on your personal data set. So this is something that all of you can do. And you can all ask different questions, uh, try asking, uh, try asking some other interesting questions you can think of. Maybe instead of analyzing, a, maybe try picking a big group rather than a small group, maybe try picking a personal conversation. So that it's, and maybe if you want to try this on messenger, you can probably export from messenger as well. If you want to try this on, um, Snapchat or something, you can do that as well. So that was one example. And then there are a couple more here. So there is one called analyzing browsing patterns using pandas. This is also another very interesting blog post. I highly recommend checking it out. This is by one of our mentors, Karthik Godavad. So here, what Karthik did was he used an Google based a Google application called Google takeout. So you can go to takeout.google.com. And from there, you can download your entire browsing history. If you have been using Google Chrome and you've been logged in, so you can download it as a CSV file uh, or sorry, as a JSON file. So you can see here that it is uh, downloaded as a JSON file. And this is what it looks like. So you have just uh, the time at which uh, you visited a page, the title of the page and the URL of the page. And it's a very simple data set, but it is a very personal data set. So there are a lot of interesting insights that you can gather based on these. And then based on this, there are some, what Karthik has then done is to take this single, take the single column, which is the number of uh, microseconds from, so, so this is called the UTC time. And he has converted out of it. He has picked out things like the year, the month, the date. So that shows data processing skills where you're taking this particular microsecond time and converting into converting it into your date month. And then similarly, uh, what he's also done is he has passed the URL and captured the root domain out of it, because maybe you want to know how much time have you spent on Gmail? How much time have you spent on Facebook? How much time have you spent on, or how much activity have you done on Twitter, for instance? So that's where you can see that there is this get domain function. There is this get day of the week function. There is this convert time function. So this is another thing that this is showcasing. How do you process, how do you start with some raw data and process it into more structured data? And after doing all of these things, after doing all of these things, you can see that now he started to do visualizations. So here, for example, one very simple thing he's doing is checking how many of the websites are secure versus unsecure. This means HTTP versus HTTPS. Here he's uh, analyzing weekday versus weekend browser usage. Here he's analyzing. Okay. This is another very interesting one. This is a heat map. So this is showcasing on each day of uh, a particular month. Uh, I believe. Yeah. On each day of a particular month, he is looking at his usage throughout the day and dark means a lot of usage and light means very little usage. So you can see that he spends a lot of time around uh, between 10 AM to 2 PM browsing. So probably for work and then spend some time at night uh, from 7 PM to 11 PM, probably for leisure. Okay. So there's a lot you can do here. Uh, this is again, this is barely scratching the surface as he had many questions about stack overflow. So he tried to look up what are the most common stack overflow questions he's uh, asking. 
So you see here that it turns out that the most common stack overflow questions are actually related to Python in his case and so on. And then there's a word cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So you can check out the third one here as well. The third one is a more standard kind of algorithm, uh, a standard kind of analysis where it is a data set that is publicly available. So it's not something that you have to gather. It's not a personal data set, but this is probably something probably most likely going to be your first project is going to be something like this, where you're going to find a data set from some online source such as Kaggle. So do check out the third one as well. This is analyzing the Google play store. So things like, let's see, let's look down. How do the app ratings vary? So this is data of all the apps on the Google play store. And you can see that approximately ratings are in the range of 4.0 to 4.4. Anything more than that is an exceptional app. Anything less than that is a bad app and so on. Counts of apps in each category, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And so now I want to spend some time talking about where do you get these skills? If you don't have them already, there are a couple of places. These are very simple skills. These are beginner level skills. So one is the zero to pandas course. We have data analysis with Python zero to pandas. This is at zero to pandas.com. This course is now in a self-paced mode. So there are six lessons here. You can work through the lessons. Each lesson has a video. You can watch the video. You can uh, open up this Jupyter notebook. So each lesson also comes with a Jupyter notebook. So you can open up this Jupyter notebook and then you can run this notebook online, make changes. Then there are also assignments. So there are three assignments, three weekly assignments, one for you to practice Python, one for you to practice NumPy, one for you to practice pandas. And you learn as part of this NumPy, pandas, basic Python also, and uh, visualization with matplotlib and Seaborn. And finally, as part of this course, you do a course project on exploratory data analysis. And in fact, the final lesson is actually a case study of an exploratory data analysis project. So definitely do this course if you haven't uh, yet. If you are doing some of the other courses, you may want to first uh, do this alongside or maybe before you complete the other course. Uh, this is really helpful. And uh, then definitely do a project and then definitely try and write a blog post as well. I'm telling you a lot of people stop at building the project part, but it really helps to write a blog post. I cannot stress it enough. Okay. Another one, another course that I will recommend is the Python for data science and machine learning bootcamp. Uh, this course on Udemy is great. This is how I learned many of these things. Uh, so you can do this as well. It comes for a small price about $10 or so, uh, but it's, I, I think it's a pretty good course and it has, a, it is pretty comprehensive in the things it covers. Although you, if you're doing zero to pandas, you need no, you do not need to do this course. If some people prefer a different style of teaching. So this is another option for you. If you do not find this good enough for your purposes. Okay. Okay. So that was the first project. So moving forward, one thing that I wanted to cover was where to find data sets. And I think we've gone over this many times, but I just want to show you once again. You just want to go to kaggle.com slash datasets. This is probably the best source for datasets. And over here, look, go into the data tab. And this here, you may, it may take some searching. So it may not be very easy to find uh, datasets here. Sometimes you may have to look for the right keyword. Sometimes you may have to add filters. But what I like to do is I like to sort by most words. And depending on the type of data I'm looking for exploratory data analysis, typically uh, what you want is some kind of a CSV file. So I select a CSV file and you want at least maybe a few thousand rows of data. So if you're looking for at least a few thousand rows of data, then you, the data set might have to be larger than 10 MB in size. So you may want to just put in that you want a data set of size larger than 10 MB. If not 10, maybe try one MB. And you can see here already, we are starting to see pretty good data sets. So you have US accidents, 3.5 million records, Zomato, Bangalore restaurants or restaurants in Bangalore. There's a lot of information about uh, restaurants that is captured by Zomato. Netflix price data. So this was a competition that was organized by Netflix. Gun violence data, anime recommendations, artworks, used cars, crimes, Spotify, all of these are great data sets for data analysis, right? 
and you can use this uh, library we've created a library for you to for make to make it easy for you to download these data sets so all you need to do is uh, install this library pip install open data sets import the library and uh, grab the data set url which is let's say spotify data here grab this url and simply call open data sets dot download and when you do that you will be asked to enter your kaggle credentials and you can follow the instructions here so you can you can you have to go into your account and get a kaggle.json file etc cetera, etc cetera. you can follow that but it's pretty straightforward okay how do you get started with a project one one thing you can do is just go to jovian jovian.ai click on new notebook blank notebook give it a title let's say we are analyzing spotify data analysis okay or spotify tracks eda i will keep it public create the for create the file and click run and you can run on any of these options uh, normally for data analysis i like to use binder and it'll take a second or two to start up not long so you start up binder and then you download the data set on the jupyter notebook that opens up and then you just save it back to your jovian profile so you can do all of this online you do not have to i mean if you want to you can install things on your computer but the more important part is to build the project so to get started you can just start online you can use online resources you can create the project on jovian you can run it on binder you can run it on google colab you can run it on kaggle i think you get the idea so in any case i'll keep that aside so kaggle is the best place but then there are also a lot of other places on kaggle there is also previous competitions you can look at kaggle competitions so go to kaggle competitions and look at the completed competitions so there have been about i think over 100 or so competitions on kaggle and the competition data is actual real world data that some company has put together and shared with kaggle uh, for creating a crowdsourced project okay so the this is actual real world data you will find all the challenges that you find with real world data which is missing values incorrect values mislabeled data and sometimes the data sets are very large sometimes the data sets are quite small but you have to make predictions on a larger data set uh, so this is a great data set a great source of data sets both for data analysis and also for machine learning which brings us to the second project that you should be doing so after you do a project on exploratory data analysis so now you understand how to process a data set how to clean a data set and how to analyze a data set the next thing you should do is try to build a classical machine learning project and by classical machine learning we mean all the machine learning techniques that have come before uh, today's deep learning and neural networks so before this is probably before 2013 2014 so this includes techniques like regression so you have linear regression logistic regression polynomial regression this include techniques like k means this includes things like random forest decision trees gradient boosting and then of course so these are some supervised learning techniques but you also have unsupervised learning techniques like clustering and then you have things like collaborative filtering Uh, and and if these concepts don't make sense right now these terms don't make sense that's okay i will also point you to the right courses where you can learn about these uh, where you can learn about these uh, machine learning algorithms and these machine learning techniques but it's important to cover these techniques because uh, when you start working as a data analyst or as a machine learning uh, practitioner you will most likely be working with what is called tabular data which is data which looks like a spreadsheet or data which looks like a database table and on tabular data especially when you have smaller data sets it is often these classical machine learning techniques that give good results or good enough results and the other thing is also that these classical machine learning techniques have better explainability compared to deep learning so although deep learning seems like the hot thing right now although well although everybody is talking about it and most papers are coming out around deep learning but a lot but deep learning is a black box and its applications are better suited for unstructured data at the moment but for most 
real business problems you will have to do some classical machine learning all the techniques that i talked about and you will have to work on the explainability aspect of it as well so you should also uh, be able to tell why your model is giving the results that it is giving especially if you're working in areas like finance or if you're working in anything that is regulated for example insurance you need to explain why your model gives a certain result and often you will also be asked by whoever you're presenting it to why to explain how your model works so that's why that is important and the step the way for doing it once again is to find a data set online and for machine learning projects i would suggest that past kaggle competitions are great you can see here like customer santander customer transaction prediction so this is as you can probably guess this is information about customer transactions and the objective is to identify who will make a transaction predicting box office revenue so can you predict based on who is in a movie based on let's say title of the movie director of the movie the budget of the movie can you predict its uh, box office revenue that's an interesting problem that's a classical machine learning problem let's see analyzing nfl game data then pubg can you predict the battle royale finish of pubg players so looking at looking at past matches and predicting who is going to win a particular match or who, what at what position is somebody going to finish these are all good problems so before you do any modeling though you should be able to first understand and describe the modeling objective so for example you need to be able to tell what type of data it is normally for classical machine learning you will be working with tabular data not with images text and audio this should probably be changed but still there is there's still some variation in the data is it time series data is it just regular like database columns data is it maybe some kind of sensor measurements that have to be interpreted in a certain way so there is always some information that you need to know about the data before you can actually start working on the data so you should have that you should be able to document that you should be able to identify that you should be able to identify what type of problem it is is it regression is it classification is it unsupervised is it something like is it a recommendation problem a collaborative filtering things like that you need to be able to identify what type of problem it is and then you need to perform any data cleaning if required so in some sense an exploratory data analysis project is included within a machine learning project but it still helps to first have a separate exploratory analysis project so that you can pick and apply the right skills when you need to okay uh, not every machine learning project will involve all of these uh, involve data cleaning or involve a lot of exploratory analysis but it is always helpful to do some eda always helpful to plot some graphs look for correlations ask questions about the data and the more you understand the data the better you will get at model building a uh, one important lesson here is feature engineering as well so once you do exploratory analysis you can figure out what new features you can create and this is one of the things with classical machine learning algorithms that there is a lot of feature engineering involved because the algorithms themselves are quite shallow as in there's not much you can do uh, you just have to basically put the data into the algorithm and you get the result out of it now if your data is poor if your features are not strong then your algorithm cannot do a good job for instance if you have time in microseconds and then maybe your algorithm your machine learning algorithm will not be detect be able to detect weekly patterns so what you need to do is you need to also introduce a column called day of the week you need to also introduce a column called month of year you need to also introduce a column called maybe hour of day and so on right and when you create more new columns then you are able to train your model better so your feature engineering and then you have then you do the modeling then you pick a type of model so maybe you pick a random forest maybe you pick regression maybe you pick gradient boosting then you train the model you make some predictions you evaluate it on the test data set and uh, let's say you record the metrics you record the metrics of the model and then you try different hyperparameters and different types of models so this is one thing in classical machine learning that you must almost always try multiple approaches so you will almost always try regression 
and random forest and gradient boosting, et cetera, et cetera. And you will also try different kinds of hyperparameters. So here, uh, again, if you're using a library like scikit-learn, you can probably use uh, some hyperparameter optimization tools. So what is called grid search, where you try uh, for each model, there are different sets of parameters that you tune. So you can set up your uh, model to be trained with different sets of parameters, and then you can pick the best model out of it. Okay. And finally, what you need to do is then look back at all the different approaches you have tried, and then you summarize your learnings and draw the inferences and identify what can you, what, how can you further improve it? Because you cannot go on working for an, on a project forever. What you do is you stop at a certain point and you say, okay, we've achieved a good enough accuracy or a good enough loss. And uh, I'm ready to publish this project where I've tried many different ideas. I've tuned hyperparameters. I've gotten a good result, but at the same time, if you had time to continue it, what would you do? Or if somebody wants to build on your work, what should they, they do? And finally, you take this and you publish your notebook. You can put it up on GitHub, put it up on uh, Jovian, and also, again, if possible, write a blog post to describe your experiments and summarize your work. Okay, so that's a, a classical machine learning project. And we'll stop for questions at this point. Okay, so there's one question. Is there a course in Jovian which covers classical ML using Python? Uh, not yet. We are working on one. So you will probably be able to register for it sometime in February, but it is something that is coming soon. But in the meantime, though, uh, there are a couple of courses that I would recommend for this. One is machine learning on Coursera. So this is the quintessential course on machine learning. I'm sure many of you have done this already. If you haven't, you should do it. If you if you did it long ago, it's a always a good course to revise. Also, although this course is not in Python, this course is in a language called Octave. So that might be a little bit tricky, but what you can do is you can learn the concepts from this course and then re-implement them in Python. So you can using, let's say the scikit-learn library. So this is one, you can uh, do this course. At least this is a good course that sets the intuition. So you can, you will, for example, get to know, okay, what is linear regression? What is logistic regression. What do you mean by then here it talks about neural networks a little bit, but then support vector machines, unsupervised learning, dimensionality reduction, anomaly detection, recommender systems. So there are a bunch of pretty interesting things that are covered in this course. So this is one that I would recommend. Another one that is very practical is called mlcourse.ai. And this is just a set of videos uh, created by one person, but it is pretty solid because this one person has a, a long history of working in machine learning and then also participating in Kaggle competitions. Although I wouldn't say that it is sufficient today uh, to just do this course, especially because this course is in a language called Octave, not in Python. So you can do this course to get an idea of what machine learning is and what are some of the most popular techniques used for doing machine learning and what are the different kinds of problems you can solve with it and then go on to do this course called the open machine learning course or mlcourse.ai. So this course is a community course organized by open data science or ods.ai. And you can check out the lectures here. The lectures are all available on YouTube and all the code and all the data sets for this course are also available on Kaggle. And finally, if you are interested, if you want to dig in further, I will also recommend this book called Hands-On Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow. This is by published by O'Reilly. The recent edition was released in 2019 and this covers Scikit-Learn, Keras and TensorFlow. So you can definitely focus on the Scikit-Learn part of it for classical machine learning. And then for deep learning, you can look at Keras and TensorFlow. So that's your second project, classical machine learning. And I would recommend doing a classical machine learning project before you do a deep learning project, because even though deep learning is probably mo the most popular thing right now in data science, the fact of the matter is if you start working as a data analyst or a machine learning practitioner, you will be working primarily with tabular data and you will be using classical machine learning algorithms. 
for two reasons one for tabular data and especially slightly smaller data sets classical machine learning algorithms perform often just as well or sometimes better than deep learning algorithms especially things like gradient boosting and the other thing is also about explainability and interpretability because these your machine learning models will be used somewhere to make some decisions or to determine the behavior of a particular application or a particular website so you will be asked to explain why a mod the model gives a certain result so for instance in a use case like insurance before you reject somebody's application you have to give them a reason why they why it was rejected in such cases using a simple decision tree or a logistic regression might make more sense than using a complicated deep learning model or even a random forest so keep that in mind and that's why focus on classical machine learning classical machine learning is by no means dead in fact it is more widely used today than ever before so definitely spend some time doing all of these uh, learning all of these techniques and doing some projects on them in fact to land your first job you may not even need a deep learning project although it's good to have one so that brings us to our third project topic deep learning so we did a workshop on building a deep learning project from scratch so you can just follow along with the workshop it's 2 and 1/2 hours and if you simply follow along and follow all the instructions in in the workshop it goes through the entire process of a deep learning project so it starts with where to uh, starts with finding a dataset online we do that on kaggle and then understanding and describing the modeling objective so identifying what type of data you're working with identifying what type of problem it is doing any cleaning if required and performing exploratory analysis then we look at modeling where we define a model a simple network architecture then we pick some hyperparameters and we train the model then we evaluate the model and then finally we iterate with different hyperparameters and uh, different regularization techniques so do check out this workshop and you can just pause if you want to start a project you can have this video running in the background and you can just pause at different st- different places in the video and work on your project and then get back and continue so do use this as a reference guide and some example projects in deep learning and i'm sure you you may have seen a lot if you have been taking the zero to gans course that is currently ongoing so the first one is i'll give three or four examples here different kinds of examples the most common one that you tend to see is image classification so here's one blindness detection using image classification so typically we've seen in courses you'll often see images of everyday objects but in this case this dataset contains images that look like this so these are actually pictures of if i am not mistaken pictures of the retina or the human eye essentially but uh, primarily the retina and what you are required here to predict is the severity of the blindness so the severity changes from okay so severity of diabetic retinopathy on a scale of 0 to 4 so it goes from no diabetic retinopathy to mild moderate severe or proliferative dr so here's how it goes you create a training set and then you create a test set and a validation set out of it then you add some transforms because here we are looking with looking at medical images so medical images is one huge area where deep learning is helping make huge advances so that's one area where and there are also a lot of roles a lot of uh, opportunities in healthcare and in uh, medical imaging especially whether it is cell images whether it is images of the eye things like this or even things like ct scans so here what we're doing is we are applying some transforms to the uh, to the image so we are resizing it we are doing some randomized transforms like random horizontal flip converting it to a tensor and then normalizing it and then creating training and validation sets creating training and validation data loaders then defining a model architecture so in this case this i think this is done by shonak okay yeah so in this case shonak has picked the resnet 152 architecture so this is one interesting thing that you can do you look at the dataset on kaggle so if it is a dataset on kaggle you may want to just check out 
the notebooks tab on the Kaggle data set. And in the notebooks tab, try not to just copy the code, but look at the code and understand what people are doing and look through three or four notebooks, gather some ideas and try to implement it on your own. Okay. So try in general, try not to copy paste code. Even if you have to use somebody else's code, you can just put it on the side and then type it out because when you type out the code, you automatically type each variable type each operation and that forces you to think about it. So definitely at least type the code or the best is to look at the code, understand what it does and try to replicate it by looking at the documentation, by looking at other notebooks that you have written in the past or by looking at other things. So whatever you pick up good ideas, but try to replicate them and understand them. So here he is creating a model and then changing the head of the model. So here we're using a pre-trained model, the ResNet 152 model, but out of the pre-trained model, what he has done is he has removed the final layer or the fully connected layer. And this is a technique called transfer learning. Once again, something we've covered in the deep learning with PyTorch course. And then he's training the model here. So you can see that the model is being trained. Yeah. So you can see that the model is being trained here. So you train the model and you track the losses and you try different architectures. So it seems like there's a learning rate of zero uh, different learning rates have been tried here in different models as well. So here you have ResNet 152. This is ResNet 152 as well. And then this is ResNet 101. And you can try and compare the different uh, models, how the loss changes. So it seems like on ResNet 101, this is how the loss changes. You can see that the validation loss stops at around 0.35. On ResNet 152, the validation loss goes far lower to 0.125. And then on ResNet 101, once again, the validation loss is high. So you want to experiment with different, with different model architectures, with different hyperparameters. And then finally you make some predictions. So you make some predictions and then verify whether those predictions make sense. So in this case, this particular blog post does not contain predictions, but you should also always verify on maybe five, 10, 15, 20 individual images. If you're working with images and make some predictions. And then if you have a test set and you need to submit the prediction somewhere, then generate the predictions for the test set and then submit it. So that's roughly the structure of a deep learning project. And it's always important to write a conclusion. So it's important to just summarize your approach, important to summarize what you've learned, what worked, what did not work and what may be some other ideas to try out. And if you have looked at, if you have borrowed code or if you have borrowed ideas from different places, then you can also add references. Once again, a great thing to do. So that's one deep learning project. And similarly, you can check out a couple others too. We'll very briefly cover this one called classifying environmental audio recordings. So you do not always have to work with images. In this case, what you can do is audio can actually be turned into images. So here we are working with audio files and audio files look like this, which are basically waveforms, but these audio files based on certain transformations. And this is the audio file. So this seems like a clock tick, the tick of a clock probably. And this is what you see here in a waveform format. Uh, and you can use certain tools and libraries like LibRosa to convert that into this kind of an image. And after applying certain normalizations that that becomes an image like this. So now what you can do is you can transform audio files into images. And once you've transformed audio files into images, you can then use deep learning, the same techniques that we use convolutional neural networks to classify audio. So here you see here that we have this is what you end up with essentially different images of uh, different audio. And then you, yeah, so this is one batch of training data. And now what you're looking at is each pattern of audio that you see belongs to a certain category. So one could be a clock ticking, one could be a dog barking, one could be the sound of a bell and so on. And then you can perform image classification. So again, an interesting project. Here's one generating art using GANs. This is also very interesting. You take some artwork. So you take artwork and then you put that as an input to a generative adversarial network and you end up with something like this. And I would say this is pretty impressive, although it's not anything in particular, but it looks nice. 
so this is a good this is a good start in fact generating art using gans is an entire area where hundreds of people are trying many different things trying to change the inputs to gans to generate interesting pictures and artists are actively using gans in their work especially digital artists so do check it out i will not go through it in a lot of detail you can see this is a pretty big blog post here and finally here's one more so it we looked at one problem which was classification and classification can be single label or multi label we looked at a, an unsupervised learning problem which is generating art using gans a generative modeling problem and we can also do what is called regression so where we are detecting we are where we are coming up with not what class an image belongs to but specific points or coordinates on an image so for instance here we are using something called aditya has done something called pose estimation so for pose estimation he has used the tensorflow pose estimation package and once a little bit of deep learning you can look it up you can look up what pose, pose estimation is and you may have to read a tutorial you may have to read some code on github but you have all the right skills to figure out what the code means and how it works you may even have to read a paper but in most cases you can find a blog post explaining the paper so here you can look at it here that even in this case even in this case aditya has used uh, this notebook so a particular notebook to learn more about pose estimation but in any case the idea here is not to predict a single class but to predict a bunch of key points 0 to 17 so a bunch of 18 key points and using those 18 key points you can then estimate the pose of uh, the person in an image for instance here are some examples here are some examples so you can see that this these are images of cricketers and then you can see all the key points point uh, marked and then using the pose you can actually then use it use that to classify which specific shot they are taking whether this is cricket or, uh, or some other sport so this is interesting so this is a multi step problem where you take these images and convert those images into these pose variables so pose coordinates and then you run a classification model on the pose coordinates and sometimes you what you can do is you can use a pre trained model to come up with the pose coordinates so then you simply have to build a simple feed forward neural network for uh, classifying Oh uh, yeah so you can check out his notebook here yeah so th this is one other thing that you can try which is multi step deep learning problems where you're using one model to convert the data set to convert the data into a particular format let's say coordinates or embeddings and then you use that as the input into another deep learning model or possibly into a classical machine learning model one other thing that you can also do which you have not covered here is working with text data so this is where you will have to use recurrent neural networks and transformers so some learning resources for deep learning now obviously we have the course deep learning with pytorch zero to gans i hope you've done the course if you've not you can still uh, sign up for it and do all the watch all the lectures do the assignments and build a course project uh, another good set of courses is the deep learning specialization on coursera and this is good if you want to dig deeper into the theoretical side of things if you want to actually look at the math how the math works and you want to become familiar with some of the terminology that is used in deep learning it also contains a lot of practical tips for building good deep learning models so the deep learning specialization on coursera i would recommend it it's pretty good another good course to do is the practical deep learning for coders course this is also known as fast ai now you don't have to do all of these courses you can do one of them maybe two of them so you if you've done the zero to gans course maybe you can to uh, complement it you can do the deep learning specialization or if you've done fast ai then you can do the deep learning specialization or if you've done the deep learning specialization then you can do the deep learning python book so do one or two of these the more important thing is you should be able to understand most of if not all of the terminology that is used in deep learning if you're reading a blog post you shouldn't feel lost or if you're reading um, you should be able to read code so if we give you a link to a github repository you should be able to look into it and understand the code and if 
to one of the frameworks, either TensorFlow or PyTorch, to most of the other. So you just make sure to learn one framework. It doesn't have to be either TensorFlow or PyTorch specifically. It could be, it could be either one, and just have some familiarity with the other enough that you can understand it. If not, write code in it. So this one, you, this book is also pretty good. Deep learning with Python. This is in fact written by Francois Collet, who is the author of the Keras library, which is part of TensorFlow. So if you want to, if you want to have a book for reference, you can check out this book as well. So that's the third project. Now, apart from this, there are a few more projects that you can build. Now, one good thing you can do, one, one good project that you can do is something with SQL, possibly because uh, SQL or SQL, as you might call it, or basically relational databases are often very commonly used for storing information. So you will be, you will have to work with a SQL database. And if you can work on a mini project of, or maybe even just a blog post where you can demonstrate that you know how to write advanced complex SQL queries to address different use cases, uh, that will be pretty helpful. Then another project that you can work on is web scraping, web, web crawling and web scraping, which is essentially using a library like this is a library called Scrapy. So this is used to get web pages and then download information from web pages and then get the links on those web pages and crawl those web pages. So for instance, you could get a page from Amazon and get information about the product. So to actually parse the information, you will have to use this library called beautiful soup. And then you can follow all the other products listed linked to from the product page and then create a database of products in a particular category and then do analysis on that. So you can use web scraping as a technique to generate your own data set by scraping a website. And in fact, a lot of the data sets that you find on Kaggle have been created in this way. So that's one other thing that you can add. Once again, all of these other things that I'm mentioning are optional. One more thing that you can possibly look into is web development. So you can look at the Flask framework. The Flask framework is a very simple web server for Python. In fact, you can see here, a minimal application looks something like this. So you just write these four lines of code into a Python program, and then you simply share, uh, then you simply run it and you will be able to open it up in a browser and interact with it. So for example, if you open the route slash, which is localhost 8888 or wherever your, um, or whatever port your application is running at, you will see the words, hello world. Now you can go from there and instead of returning a string, you can return an HTML page. So you can also learn some HTML, CSS and JavaScript if that interests you and create an entire web application. Now you may not want to do a entire web application project where you're building a website or a web app. What you can do is you can take a machine learning model that you have created and put it up uh, and create a server and a simple user interface, uh, like a simple form. For instance, if it is a flower classification model, you can create a simple web application that allows the user to upload a file, a picture of a flower, and then it tells them which flower there, which flower the picture represents. So something simple like that, that would require about 50 to hundred lines of code with, uh, within Flask, HTML, CSS, JavaScript included, and you can deploy it to platforms like Heroku. So check out Heroku. Heroku is a simple way, a simple platform to deploy Python web applications. So you just check, check uh, getting started on Heroku with Python. It's all really simple. You know, it seems complicated, but if once you spend some time with it, then you become familiar with it and then it doesn't, it, it's actually rather simple. So these are other things that you can do. Once again, these are optional, but good to have, they will definitely set your profile apart especially when you're applying for internship or you're applying for jobs or you're reaching out to people on, on LinkedIn. And we'll talk about that at some point as well on what is the best way to reach out when you're applying for jobs, cold reach out, email reach out or getting referrals and such things. Yeah. So that pretty much covers it. There's also some more areas, things like spark, Hadoop, um, hive, no SQL, 
that you can do, but all those things are, I wouldn't say that if you're looking to just get into data science right now, I wouldn't say that you need to do any of those things. These are the three important projects for you to do exploratory data analysis, classical machine learning and deep learning. And finally, how to find projects, how to find data sets. As we've mentioned several times, Kaggle data sets is a great place to look for data sets. So you just go to kaggle.com slash data sets. A couple of tips I'll mention, uh, because I've mentioned this so many times, one good thing you can do is you can set a minimum file size. So if you're looking for slightly big data sets, data sets that have, let's say more than at least a few thousand rows of data, you probably want to put in a filter like this, maybe 10 MB, or if you're looking for image data sets, then you maybe want to put in a filter of hundred MB because each image is about a, a one, MB, or let's say tens of KBs in size, maybe up to hundred KB in size. So if, to get to a thousand images, you will need at least the data set to be at least hundred MB in size. Another thing you can do is you can add file types like CSV. You can also search by tags. So use, make use of the filters here. It's pretty powerful. One more thing to do would be to sort by, this is normally sorted by hottest, but you want to sort by the most votes. So now you can see with some filters and with some votes, we have some pretty huge data sets. The COVID data set is about seven GB. The Bitcoin data set is about 96 MB. Accidents, US accidents, that's about 300 MB. Zomato restaurants, 89 MB and so on. Uh, so explore different tags as well. Okay. So it looks like you can, let's say search for sales or business related data. Okay. Doesn't really seem to make sense, but yeah, the, the tags help as well. This is interesting. Uber pickups, SF salaries. So just by looking at these data sets, I'm sure you're probably thinking about the different things you can do with them, whether it is data analysis, visualization, or prediction of some kind movie reviews. So this is again, interesting education statistics around the world. Yeah. So Kaggle is a great place. Then there are a few more. You can check out all of these. There is enough data set. There are enough data sets on the internet. So uh, do use these resources. So that's where we will end the workshop.